going to bring this chart a little bit closer. Uh, this is kind of summarizes where we left off last week. So we looked at the first section of the book of Leviticus and how uh, Exodus ended with a crisis in chapter 40, namely that Moses could not enter the tent of meeting. And so it is a dwelling place. It is a tabernacle. God's glory dwells there, but it's not yet a tent of meeting. God's people cannot use this uh, house of God to have fellowship with him. And really, that's the, the movement and the story of the book of Leviticus, three great stages by which God's dwelling is transformed into a tent of meeting. And we looked at how already in chapters 9 and 10, the end of the first unit, Moses and Aaron are able to enter the tent of meeting specifically, although the story doesn't end there. But nevertheless, between that crisis and initial resolution, we saw there's a set of laws, and that those laws explain that movement from crisis to resolution. So from Leviticus 1 through 7, we have God's revelation of the sacrifices. This is the way that you approach me, uh, God says. And then in chapter 8, we have the ordination and uh, consecration of the Aaronic priesthood. So the way to have fellowship with God is sacrifices ordained by God and then an ordained priesthood, particularly a high priest, to offer those sacrifices in our behalf. And now I want to, uh, by way of sort of summary of the, the legislation of laws in chapters 1 through 7, just give us a walk through this evening of a worship ceremony following this uh, threefold um, journey of, of sacrifices, going from expiation with the sin offering to consecration with the whole burnt offering, and then fellowship and communion with the meal of the peace offering. And we'll say a word about the tribute as well. But just to refresh our memory, we got those three categories from what is referred to as the procedural order of sacrifices. So the sacrifices are listed in a variety of orders in different contexts uh, throughout the Bible. But the procedural order is the order by which um, people actually worship God. And we see that in the inaugural worship service. So to begin, I'll read once more a passage we looked at uh, last week. That's Leviticus 9, 22 through 24. And this gives us just a, a very a brief summary of the whole chapter, uh, the worship ceremony. <clears throat> so Leviticus chapter 9, beginning with verse 22 we read, then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, blessed them, and came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering. And I showed you last time that if you move up several verses, you see that the burnt offering is followed by the tribute offering. And, um, excuse me, I just lost my place. Uh, the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, <clears throat> and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Uh, a glorious description of the inaugural worship ceremony. This is the first uh, corporate worship ceremony at the tabernacle um, here in Leviticus 9. And so... Let's uh, break down a little bit more some of the steps, or we call them rites, that, that would uh, take place throughout this journey of worship. It's a journey, as we'll see, into God's heavenly abode by faith, um, a journey that uh, brings you into God's house and into fellowship with Him. I'm not going to repeat all of the rites, so as I mentioned last week, you're going to slay the sin offering, and there's going to be blood manipulation, where you're going to slay the whole burnt offering, there'll be blood manipulation you'll slay the animal for the peace offering and manipulate the blood. But I'm just going to skip uh, through the highlights. So blood is uh, really emphasized for the sin offering and then the fire and turning into smoke for the burnt offering and the meal for the peace offering. So what would be the first step? Uh, some, I think, legitimately would start the first step with you're actually choosing the animal. And they say how oh, that's in likeness to God, how he chooses Israel and things like that. And that's True. Nevertheless, when we read through Leviticus, that doesn't seem to be uh, the, the emphasis. And so I begin with the presentation rite. And that's where you, having chosen one of the animals designated clean, a sheep or a goat, uh, you bring it to the tabernacle and you're um, essentially presenting it to the priest, um, declaring that you want to uh, 
uh, sacrifice this animal. And this presentation rite um, is really especially important and it would have uh, a lot of potential for pastoral possibilities, um, pastoral moments uh, on the part of the, the priesthood with the lady. For example, um, say that you're a priest and someone brings you this animal, a sheep or a goat, and you notice just the slightest blemish. Um, perhaps it's difficult to see. You had to sort of bend uh, over to, to see under the animal or something like that. Um, that's bad news. And it could go one of two ways. Uh, one, the person knows about it and is trying to present it anyway, which obviously uh, shows a rebellious heart going through the motions. Or you can think more kindly of the person and say, well, they missed it. But that's also bad news too, isn't it? It shows that there's a, a negligence. There's a, a lack of fear of the Lord. There, there is no true consideration of what it means to follow God's word and bring uh, the sort of animal that, that he asked for. And you can also imagine um, a scenario where uh, people may bribe the priest to just look the other way. Um, you come across being able to worship and uh, you perhaps um, save money by not giving uh, the best of your flock. You give a little bit to the priest and everybody's happy. That sounds awful. We know that that happened throughout the history of the church, uh, but we also know it happened in Old Testament history. Think about Malachi. Um, Malachi, what, what's the context for Malachi? God had already disciplined his people. He had exiled them into Babylon, brought them back. He raised up uh, leaders like Nehemiah and Ezra to teach the people. They rebuilt the temple. It wasn't as nice as the previous temple, but nevertheless, uh, they get the priesthood uh, back. You know, through Ezra, they're checking out the lineage and ensuring that they have a proper priesthood. They begin worship again, and already um, the worship of God has um, declined. And God raises up the prophet Malachi in Hebrew, that means my messenger. He raises up this messenger uh, to give this great warning to his people to let them know how upset he is with their worship. Uh, Malachi chapter 1, the end of verse 6, uh, the Lord is a, a repeating apparently a lot of questions that they're asking Malachi. You know, what's, what are we doing so bad that you keep castigating us and giving us this you know, message of doom? Well, God says, um, the end of verse 6, Where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name? Yet you say, and this is what they're telling Malachi, In what way have we despised your name? And here's the Lord's answer, Malachi 1 verse 7. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? I and mean, this is precisely what the people are doing. And if you read a lot of the post-exilic prophets, you'll see that these, this rabble of God's people that have returned, they're, they're just um, in the mud. Um, they're getting hit by famines, uh, life. They didn't come back to a, a glorified you know, new land. Uh, there are still enemies encroaching. Um, they, there's, it's just a time of rebuilding and there's a low spirituality. And you can imagine the temptation not to give your best to the Lord. And so they're given lame animals. When I was pastoring in Northeast Tennessee, um, you know, a lot of our members were, were farmers and dealt with cattle and things. We had some outsiders uh, who, uh, I, I don't know if they were from New York or what, but they, they retired, bought big property, um, and uh, they just thought it'd be fun to have animals. And so they, they got non-working animals, not farm animals, just showy animals, these really rare, exotic, I don't even remember what they were called, cattle with the huge long horns. And um, one time when I was over, they were uh, just showing me uh, their, their prized possessions. And I remember the gentleman making a remark that uh, this beast over here would be dead in a month. And I said, really, how, how can that be? And it looks just as strong as all the other ones. And he said he had noticed just some sort of faint uh, 
haziness in one of the eyes. And uh, again, I don't, is it my field? But apparently by experience, he'd learned that that was the beginning of some sort of disease and uh, the animal would be dead. And you can appreciate how you think, well, right now it looks healthy and strong. Just the slight indication, go offer it up as a burnt offering. Um, but this is where, again, the, the presentation, right, the priest would be enabled to deal with the heart. Um, did you know about this? Or if you didn't, how could you be so careless uh, with the worship of God? So the presentation, right, the priest inspects the animal. It is fit uh, to be brought into worship. The next step is the hand leaning rite, where the worshiper takes his hand. And the word in Hebrew, semicha, is it's actually you're, you're pushing down the, 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 the head of the animal. Uh, you're putting weight on it and pressing down. And there's a variety of suggestions about what this means. That there is growing consensus, and that's what I'll offer you. <clears throat> One thing that it doesn't mean, but that's very popular, is that at this point, the worshiper's sins are being transferred to the animal. It's a very popular notion, and there's a ring of truth to it, especially when we apply it to Christ. We have to be careful, though. Christ fulfills the entire Levitical system. And we get into a little bit of trouble when, when we take one particular aspect of a sacrifice uh, versus another. But once we understand the whole theology of worship in the Old Testament and the tabernacle, um, this becomes ruled out. Uh, we need to offer God a clean substitute on behalf of the worshiper. And even its death is the death of a righteous, blameless substitute on behalf of the worshiper. This is how we approach God. And um, once, if we transferred our sin to that animal, then that animal would be unfit to offer up to God. Uh, so a lot of people would point to, for example, the Day of Atonement, where there is definitely a transfer of sins, but it, it becomes the exception that proves the rule. So what happens in the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, is the high priest puts two hands on the head of that, that scapegoat. So already it's a different gesture. Um, not every gesture of hand leaning is the same. Same thing with, you know, uh, leaning of hands uh, for ordaining. Um, but what's very telling is we also read in Leviticus 16 that after the high priest uh, lays both hands on the head of the goat, what does he do then? He confesses the sins of Israel over the head. That's again a new step that we don't hear about in the early chapters of Leviticus. So he is clearly confessing all the sins of God's people, heaping them upon um, the scapegoat. But then what really seals the argument is what happens to that goat? Do you bring it into the presence of God through sacrifice in the Holy of Holies? You drive it far away from the face of God. Ever eastward uh, is always the direction of being removed from the presence of God. So that goat that gets loaded up with the sins and guilt of Israel is actually driven away into the wilderness. That's where um, it belongs. Whereas the other goat, the one for the Lord, is the blameless one or unblemished uh, clean animal that gets sacrificed and its blood is brought into uh, God's presence. And so uh, it's not transfer of sins. The, the, the big consensus that you'll find in commentaries that I would agree with is that it is a right of identification. Basically, the worshiper is saying, I am this animal or this animal represents me. In many ways, uh, the worship in the Old Testament is vicarious. Um, you are not fit to enter God's presence, but this substitute um, is your representative, and in a sense, you worship God through this uh, substitute. So you'll find this again in, in most uh, evangelical commentaries, and um, it dates back, um, it's got a, a great pedigree. So you're saying, I am this animal. It's a system of representation. The sheep is a clean animal, represents clean uh, people like the Israelites, whereas we'll get into this, Lord willing, uh, maybe next week. Unclean animals like pigs represent uh, the Gentiles, those who aren't cleansed by covenant and the sacrificial system. So you have a clean animal that represents you and it's blameless. That's why it needs to be unblemished. It represents a blameless, wholehearted life. One scholar uh, translates blamelessness as wholehearted as in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Um, 
the, the, the symbolism is that this substitute is one that loves God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength. Wholehearted devotion unto God. That is the kind of life that's fit to enter the presence of God. Just like Psalm 15, who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? Same word, blameless, that's used of Noah, that's also used of animals. When it's used of animals, it's translated unblemished. But there's the hand leaning right. This animal uh, is me. And so this animal is going to be sacrificed and offered up to God. And in a sense, you're offering yourself to God through it, but it's also a solicitation of the worshipers, we'll see, that we need to live such a blameless life represented symbolically um, by uh, this blameless animal. Then thirdly, we get to the slaughterite, and we talked a little bit about this uh, last week. Uh, it's a surprising to many that you as the worshiper would be the one to slaughter uh, the animal. Um, you uh, cut it across the neck, getting the major arteries, you're ensuring the, the, the most proficient flow of blood. The priest comes and he's there to collect the blood and that's when his work really begins in earnest after inspecting uh, the animal that you have brought. And so once you have laid your hand on this animal and said, this animal represents me, I am this animal, and you slay it, I think it is hard to get around the idea that th this is in, in part at least a, an act of confession. Um, this is what I deserve and I have a blameless substitute dying in my place. But then we talked a little bit about the sin offering, the blood and expiation. That blood's going to be manipulated. So um, that blood is uh, going to be daubed on the horns of the altar, poured at the side of the altar on the Day of Atonement. It'll actually be brought in uh, to the Holy of Holies, sprinkled toward the Ark of the Covenant, uh, sprinkled inside the holy place. And uh, blood is, is one of these uh, dual um, uh, it has dual significance. So yes, I think it represents blood. God sees it. He knows that there's been a righteous substitute that has died just like the Passover blood. But what God specifically says in Leviticus 16 is that blood represents the life. Um, Leviticus 17, I don't know if I just said 16, but it's 17, uh, it should be verse 11. God says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now the word life there at the beginning of verse 11 is actually the word soul. Uh, we don't want this idea of duality like soul versus body, soul versus flesh, so they translate it life. Uh, but basically the point that's being made, the soul of the flesh, uh, I've given it as atonement for your souls. In other words, life for life, soul for soul. Uh, the blood of this animal represents the life of this animal that's shed um, to make atonement for your life or for your soul. And uh, it's a, the system of representation. And so in many ways, uh, the blood, yes, represents death, but it also represents life, the life of this blameless substitute. And in a strange way, that's difficult for us to comprehend uh, because of the theology that life conquers death, something we'll get into more in the days to come. Uh, there's an idea here, one top Leviticus scholar named Jacob Milgram talks about blood almost as detergent. It wipes away the stain, the pollution of death and sin. Not in a literal way, but there's something to this idea, the, the blood that's sprinkled in the holy place, in the holy of holies, in the altar. It's cleansing God's house from the pollution of people's sins. And it's, it's catechism. It's symbolic. It's theological. But the idea is not um, death, but the life of a blameless substitute is what it takes to cleanse away the stain of sin and death. And so uh, not for no reason, Israel's sacrificial system has been called the blood cult uh, more than any other culture that we know of in the ancient Near East the Israelites dealt with blood. I mean, the priests sprinkled blood, dashed blood, poured out blood. I mean, the, 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 the words used for what they do with blood, it's just tremendous. Um, Hebrew uses very sparingly few words, but when it comes to the sort of manipulation, we, it, it, it's almost Greek-like. They, they've just got all sorts of words uh, for different nuances. I hope nobody's getting sick as I uh, speak. 
Uh, but they, they're dealing with blood, and it's a reminder, again, of the, the great cost of sin uh, the, and the great remedy that we'll get through Christ. So the idea, again, is that of expiation. Through the manipulation of blood, you as the worshiper, uh, through this uh, first set of offerings, these are offerings of true negation, sin offering and the guilt offering, where your sins are being expiated. They're being removed from the face of God. The stain of them are being cleansed away. You are being cleansed so that you come to square one. Um, this is the neutral place. And once your sins are dealt with, that's not enough. What pleases God is a life of righteousness. And that's where we move to a more positive um, idea of worship when we get to the whole burnt offering. So this is sort of just the prefix, the preliminary to true worship, which then begins with the whole burnt offering, uh, the burning rite. And so the burnt offering is the burning rite par excellence because this is the one offering where the entire animal is consumed. Now, anything else to be considered an offering has to have some aspect of it in the fire. So if it's a sin offering, part of the flesh is going to be put in, in the fire. Another part of the flesh is given to the priest. For the peace offering, part of the meat goes to the priest, part goes to the worshiper, and part goes on the altar. But for the whole burnt offering, everything except the skin of the animal is put there on the altar. So it's the burning rite uh, par excellence, as I said. And there's three aspects of the theology of this sacrifice I just want to present in, in summary. Um, one is the idea of consecration, which we've already mentioned last week. So the whole animal, whole burnt offering, nothing held back. This offering is soliciting from you as the worshiper this kind of life. You could not worship through the whole burnt offering without this idea being strongly emphasized. God wants all of me, not just a part of me. Um, this is what the offering signifies. And this is why it's not just a substitute, but a vicarious substitute. Um, it's even with Christ. Yes, he obeys on our behalf, but in order then to sanctify us and to draw us into his holiness and obedience, which is uh, the life work of the Holy Spirit and the means of grace uh, in our life. And the Holborn offering is soliciting this from the Israelite worshiper and from Israel as a whole. Remember, the Holborn offering is what's offered every morning, every evening, every day of the life of Israel on the Sabbath, twice in the morning, two, two lambs, and twice in the evening, two lambs in the evening. This is the foundational, the paradigmatic sacrifice um, that represents the whole worship system. So the altar is not called the altar of sin offering. It's not called the altar of the peace offering, but it's called the altar of burnt offering. This is what God desires beyond anything, is a life given completely to him we need the sin offering before we can even give ourselves to God. So remember that. We can't be consecrated to God unless our sins are expiated. We can't have fellowship with God until we're consecrated to him. And that's part of the movement that we're um, going through here. So again, what does it mean to be consecrated to God? Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. So the Lord our God is one. You shall have no other God before him, which means you must love him with all your heart, soul, and strength. But the second aspect that I think is more difficult for us to really appreciate is the idea of transformation. I think I touched on this just a little bit last time. The offering is turned into smoke. It's not consumed. Uh, this isn't a picture of hell, God destroying um, sinners. This is more than anything else the idea of sanctification. That animal, which, which is blameless, nevertheless is creaturely and partakes of the stuff of earth and it must be transformed before it can ascend into God's presence. So even the angels that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6 cover their eyes. These are blameless spirits. How much more um, a blameless uh, substitute that partakes of um, this material creation it needs to be transformed before it can rise to God as a pleasing aroma. And so the idea is transformation, and the, the actual word for burning in Leviticus is very unique. So um, anytime something is consumed on the altar, it uses a specific Hebrew word, it's hiktir in Hebrew. That, um, that root is the same root for the word incense. It's the same root for the word censer. And so the idea is never that something is getting burned up or consumed uh, on the altar uh, 
Um, it's the idea that something is being turned into incense. And in fact, there's a few scholars that prefer that translation. Instead of burning on the altar, transform into incense on the altar because they see how critical this is. In other words, if you were burning garbage in your backyard, that's going to use a different Hebrew word, seraph. Um, and even the parts of the animal that are not put on the altar, like for the sin offering, the offal and stuff, things that get destroyed outside the camp and burned, that burning is a different word. This other word, hiktir, is used only for what takes place on the altar, and it's the root of turning into fragrance, into incense. And this is the idea, again, of, of transformation. Um, it, it turns that blameless life through the fires of God into a pleasing aroma, and this is the great Old Testament picture of atonement or propitiation. What's propitiation? It's pleasing God, satisfying God so that his wrath is abated. And this is the, the great drama of um, the flood story. The flood story is the first time we ever read of the burnt offering. And uh, it is uh, an amazing um, message that it's teaching. Uh, chapter 8 of Genesis, verse 20, we read that Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And here's this picture. It's uh, an anthropomorphism. It's condescension of God for our sakes. But look at just how um, the Bible is not afraid to give us this picture of God. Verse 21, the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. This is fascinating. If you realize that God is the main character in the flood story, you realize that this is the culmination of the flood story. Because the flood story begins with God speaking to his heart. Um, we read in Genesis 6.6, 6, The Lord was sorry that he made man on earth. He was grieved in his heart, so he said, I will destroy man whom I've created. Now, after these burnt offerings, he smells the soothing aroma. He speaks to his heart and says, I'll never destroy man again the way that I did. And that would have been teaching the first Israelites, uh, first and second generation, who are given the altar of, of burnt offering. It will be teaching them the magnificent, God-ordained efficacy of this offering. By God's own design, this offering... Um, pleases God. It's a soothing aroma. It satisfies him. So God is not satisfied merely with the negation. So he had just destroyed the whole generation of Noah, and yet his wrath had not been satisfied. What satisfies God finally? This positive righteousness, this full consecration represented by the whole burnt offerings transformed into a pleasing aroma so that it ascends to him. And the picture of him is in heaven, that that incense rises, he smells it, he's satisfied, his anger is abated, he's propitiated. And so the idea of transformation um, is, is a big part of this um, sacrifice. Then the third aspect is the aspect of ascension that I've already mentioned a bit. In fact, in Hebrew, uh, this what we translate as whole burnt offering is olah, and uh, we're not talking about um, uh, what happens with, uh, in a bull ring uh, with, um, in Mexico, uh, although a bull is obviously takes part of that as well. We're talking about Hebrew ola, which is basically built off of the verb to ascend, which is Allah, and it's in a participle form. So it's basically the name of the sacrifice is the ascending one. Why? Well, that's the major impression of the sacrifice. If you were there in the wilderness or later on in the temple, morning and evening uh, service, and uh, you watch this daily burnt offering, what would impress you most is this huge column of smoke as the entire animal. It's so the, the animal is not destroyed or incinerated. It's transformed and ascending into the presence of God. Um, it's such a difficult concept. I just wrote an article on, on this, and because it, uh, it sounds so strange, and I didn't want people pointing fingers at me like, what is he talking about? I'd quote like a dozen people, uh, Leviticus scholars, just so um, 
someone who's new to um, studying ritual and sacrifices in the Old Testament would see that this is something that there's great consensus on. So the fire doesn't destroy the animal, it transforms it so that the animal can ascend as a pleasing aroma to God. So that I typically refer to the altar of ascension offering as the BC version of Scotty Beam Me Up. And you may think that I'm joking, but I got a proof text for you. Um, remember the story of Samson, uh, when God, through the angel of the Lord, announces to the parents, the future parents of Samson, that they're going to give birth to um, a child who's going to be a, a judge in Israel. We read this. So this is uh, Judges chapter 13, verse 16. And the angel or messenger of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food, but if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. Then skipping it down to verse 19, So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering, that's the tribute offering that always follows the burnt offering, and he offered it upon the rock to the Lord. And he, that is the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame ascended up to heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. So how does the angel return to his heavenly abode, the messenger of Yahweh? Through the ascension offering, he ascends uh, to heaven. And that's part of the theology here. Again, the, the animal is a blameless substitute. That substitute doesn't just die or get destroyed or incinerated. It gets transformed so that it can ascend into God's presence as a pleasing aroma. So when God smells that pleasing aroma, as it were, an anthropomorphism, what is it that pleases him? Not that the animal was destroyed on earth, but that the animal that represents wholehearted devotion to him has ascended into his presence and pleased God. Uh, Paul uses a lot of this language as well when he talks about our lives need to be a pleasing aroma uh, to God. And we'll come back to that idea in a moment. So you are having this journey into the house of God. Now through the ascension offering, through this blameless substitute, you have ascended into God's heavenly abode. What comes next? The tribute offering. And again, most translations say grain offering or a cereal offering. The word is actually tribute offering, and it makes sense if you've got this theological journey in mind. When you visit the king, you bring a tribute. This isn't about bringing something to make you acceptable. This is more about honoring and glorifying God. Uh, the same word for tribute is used when Israel, for example, the northern kingdom is uh, under the Assyrians, and they need to send tribute to the Assyrian king. When you visit the great king, um, the great uh, king over all the gods and all of that that we looked at when we were in Exodus, you bring a tribute. It's just, it's part of um, glorifying and exalting him as the great king. So that's why the burnt offering is always followed by the tribute offering. You never want to enter God's presence without that tribute. Now we have a custom, even in our own um, Western hospitality, um, when I invite someone over, often that guest is going to come bring in what? What kind of a gift? A bottle of wine. Those get a second invitation. Um, or, you know, you bring a potted flower or something. Um, they don't get a second invitation necessarily. <laughs> I'm kidding. But this is, yeah, this is the tribute offering. So you're bringing... Food and wine. Wine is going to be part of the tribute offering that, that um, you bring, that you pour on the altar after the ascension offering. And it's acknowledging that I'm approaching the great King of Kings, the creator of all things, the maker of heaven and earth. Let me bring a gift. It's, it's a lot of the, the same theology as the tithe, rendering thanks uh, unto him. And then finally, we move to the communion rite through the peace offering. So, uh, now the priest gives you some of the meat back and you have a feast in a clean place that's considered a sacred feast with your family, uh, your friends. You, you invite the indigent, uh, the Levite uh, later on when the context of being in the land. And you have this festive banquet uh, 
understood to be in the presence of God. It's a, it's a banquet of thanksgiving. Um, it really is the, the roots of our Eucharist, our Thanksgiving meal. It's God's people. This meat, remember, has been set aside. It's holy. Um, it is for holy use. And the idea, I think Wenham has it right in his commentary on uh, Leviticus, the idea is God is supplying this meat. It belongs to him. Uh, we'll look at the definition of holiness and clean and unclean, Lord willing, next week. But basically, holiness means belonging to the Lord. And that meat is holy. It belongs to God. He gives you some to enjoy the feast. And that also relates to this idea. We have entered the house of God, and God is like this ancient Near Eastern host. He lavishes hospitality upon his people. And part of that hospitality is this great feast that we enjoy. And this is what all the songs of worship, these psalms, are talking about. I've jotted a few down in my notes. Um, many of these will be familiar to you, but think of Psalm 23.5. Um, you have the shepherding imagery. I'm, I'm, God is my shepherd, I'm a sheep. And then it uh, merges into hospitality imagery once there's a rival. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Isn't it amazing to think of God waiting on us, the, the great host that lavishes his hospitality on us? I had a friend growing up, um, and I was probably 14 or 15. He was one of these cool 18-year-olds. He was down at the military base at Homestead. Um, and he would ride his bike to our house every Saturday with a big, empty uh, container and uh, go in our refrigerator, sometimes not even saying hi, fill it up with milk. And back in those days, I don't know if you guys remember the strawberry quick powder, it was really popular. Dump a bunch of it, stir it up, and then leave and, and ride off. And he did this enough times that my dad, uh, Friday nights, would start hiding things. Um, uh, had another experience, I'll leave the gentleman's uh, name out, but um, good, good friend. And when I would come over, he would send his young son up um, to get scotch or something like that. But he was always very particular. Get something like the one on the left. And um, uh, in this context, um, this person's father was a very uh, famous uh, gentleman. And uh, so I got the idea that there must be standards of, of uh, the scotch in his house upstairs. So next time I come over, I told his son, you get the bottle that your dad gets when grandpa's over. And um, so uh, we do stuff like that. But what's amazing is God is not that way. God lavishes. He opens up all the cupboards, gives the best. I mean, he gave us Christ who we feast on whenever any of these poor, broken, repentant sinners come to him. And this is what the Psalms are expressing. This is the desire when we meet in God's house, Lord's Day by Lord's Day, I think that should warm our hearts. Psalm 36, they are amply sated by the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights, for with you is the fountain of life. Psalm 65, how happy is the man whom you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the good things of your house, your holy temple. And so worship is a journey to God's heavenly house. And you bring your tribute, and then he lavishes hospitality. You enjoy a feast in his presence. You enjoy fellowship with the living God and with the people of God, one another. And we taste some of the same journey, of course, in the new covenant. Uh, Hebrews 12 tells us we are sending to the heavenly Mount Zion. Calvin's theology of the sacraments. We are feasting in the heavenly places on Christ. Um, it's not that he descends, as it were, so, and, and the bread becomes uh, his body. It's surely the sign and seal of his body, but it's we ascend by the Spirit and we join that heavenly festal gathering and we have this foretaste of the powers of the age to come. So, sin offering to whole burnt offering to peace offering, expiation to consecration to fellowship and communion. It's a journey to God's house. And this is the same journey in Christ that we partake of every Lord's Day. There is actually one last rite, and that is the benediction rite. We read that in Leviticus 9. After he had offered up these offerings, the high priest lifts up his hands and blesses the people just like we enjoy the benediction. It's not a closing prayer. It is the blessing of God upon his people that strengthens us
comforts us um, for the, the days ahead. And this is the great way that worship would end uh, in the old covenant. Now think about just for a moment before I close this in prayer of the, the life of Christ. Um, we go from a blood rite, his blood is shed on the cross, he's buried, resurrected, and ascends. Uh, I just read uh, two days ago, one scholar recently bringing this theology of the ascension offering to Christ's ascension, uh, which I think is absolutely right. When the Israelite Old Testament worshippers saw that smoke ascending to God as a pleasing aroma, that, that smoke that represented the blameless, vicarious substitute transformed into incense, they were getting a preview of the ascension of Christ, who the author of Hebrews says, ascended into heaven where he appears before God for us. It, when the, the flood narrative, when he smells that pleasing aroma, that's a foretaste of God welcoming his ascended son back into his presence when he looks at his son and he sees a blameless, wholehearted life lived out of love for him, every idea, every thought, every word, lived out of love for God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is what satisfies God, my beloved, obedient son. And that son represents us. We are found in him, but he's also soliciting that same life from us. Whoever would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. We're found in him. We are holy. We are pleasing to God. We are righteous in Christ. But Christ's greater work through his spirit is to conform us to his own life so that we do please God through our obedience, just as we can displease him when we disobey. But it's that idea of Jesus' ascension. It's so crucial. It's good that we focus on the cross, but we should never separate the cross from the ascension. This is where Christ takes up his whole blameless life offered up to God, and he appears in heaven for us, and this propitiates the Father. It pleases the Father like nothing else. And so we thank God that we have such a Savior. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you and your marvelous grace and uh, providence have caused us to be alive in this era of the last days where we can look back and see Christ's fulfillment of all the types and shadows and, and how every promise is yes and amen in him. We thank you that although you uh, gave your people a wonderful means of grace through the burnt offering that we have something greater because we see Christ ascending into your presence appeasing you, having obeyed you, having laid down his life for our sakes, but to glorify you and out of love for you. Lord, we pray that you would fill our hearts with greater love for Christ and that you would cause us to walk ever closer to him, that we would be conformed to his life, that steadily uh, we would live for you and for your glory and not for ourselves, but also that by your spirit we would love the Lord's day and the Sabbath gathering of your people, that we would desire to be in your house and your presence with the family of God, our brothers and sisters, and that you would bless all these means of grace uh, to uh, purify our hearts that we might see you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.